Chapter 14 of Captain Souls and Us. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Souls and Us by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter 14 The Sea Unicorn. Ahoy! And how goes it with the able bodied seamen? called Roger, swooping down from the foremast. Tandy, polishing the brass trim on the binnacle, looked up with a welcoming grin. Tip top sails, he answered, pausing a minute to stare off toward the skyline to see whether any islands or sea serpents were visible. And look at that muscle now, marveled Roger, touching Tandy's arm admiringly with his claw. You're twice the lad you were, mate, and I'll wager my last feather you can lay any lover by the heels. If anyone gets fresh water ashore, remember you're a salt sea going sailor and you just take a poke at him. That's my advice without any charge or obligation. But then again, a chap that's a king, the royal artist of an exploring expedition, with a sea forest named after him, might not need to take any advice at all, added Roger, with a long and knowing wink. But I like you to tell me things, said Tandy, looking earnestly up at the red bird. You make everything seem so interesting and jolly. With a secret smile, for Tandy was thinking how much he would enjoy taking a poke at Didjabo, the chief Ozamandarin, the little boy went on with his polishing. If Didjabo said anything further about shutting him up in the tower, he just plain would take a poke at him. But saying nothing of all this to Roger, he called up cheerfully. How's Mophy? Has he stopped scolding and begun to eat? Roger, who was running races with himself up and down the taffrail, stopped short and held up his claw. Everything I gave him, he told Tanley solemnly, and I declare to badness he's getting to know me, mate. He only pulled out three feathers instead of a fistful when I gave him breakfast just now. Before long, he'll be so tame he'll be riding around on your shoulder. Not my shoulder, laughed Tandy, waving his bottle of polish at the red bird. Goodness, I believe you're going fond of that monkey fish, Roger. Well, why not? retorted the red bird, puffing up his chest. Ato has me, the captain has Sally, you have Kobo, so why shouldn't I have a little pet if I want one? The monkey fish seems such a strange prickly sort of pet. Tandy could hardly keep his face straight, but seeing Roger was quite in earnest, he tactfully changed the subject. "'Do you suppose we will make any new discoveries today?' he asked, screwing the cap on the bottle of polish. "'Any as important as the sea forest, I mean.' "'Why not call it by its proper name?' teased Roger, scratching his head with his left claw. "'And I think it most unlikely will strike anything as curious and important as Tazanda Forest. Two discoveries like that just couldn't happen two days running.' Still, I'll just fly up to the main truck and have a look around. Main truck? Tandy wrinkled up his brows. I thought I knew all the parts of the ship by now. You never told me about the main truck, Roger. Just the top of the mast, the brainless. Giving Tandy an affectionate little shove, Roger soared into the rigging and Tandy went joyfully off to have another look at the forest Samuel had insisted on naming after him. He had taken great pains with the painting and printing when he sketched it on the map. And now, with a sigh of complete satisfaction, he stood regarding the sea chart. Then, suddenly remembering he had promised to water Samuel Salt's plants, he jog-trotted contentedly down to the hold. The tumbleweeds in their small red pots grew so rapidly Samuel had to cut them back every day. These Tandy watered very sparingly, snapping his fingers at Mophy, who was gravely chinning himself on a branch of his artificial tree. The slips of the sea trees in their covered aquarium required no attention at all. Ato had planted all the vegetable and fruit vines from Pekinspire on the rail outside the galley, so that left only the creeping vines from Patipani Island to care for. He had just picked up one of the small potted creepers when a sharp rap tap under his toes made Tandy leap straight up into the air. Someone was knocking on the bottom of the boat. Ato! Captain! Roger, shrilled the little boy, scurrying up from the hole faster than he had ever done before. So, so somebody's knocking on the bottom of the boat. Before he could explain or tell them anything further, a perfectly terrific knock from below made the crescent moon shiver from end to end. Samuel and Atto, leaning over the port rail, turned around so suddenly they bumped their heads smartly together. Next with a scrape, screech and splintering of timber, a giant white horn came tearing up through the decks. Well, croaked Roger, falling off the main truck and coasting crazily down to the deck. What? Whatever and ever is that? he quavered, pointing a trembling claw at the rigid white column between the main and mizzen masts. 
Samuel did not even try to explain, for at that instant the ship began to rise, to fall, to lash and plunge both up and down and east and west. Hooking his arms through the rail, Tandy blinked, gasped, and shudderingly waited for the crescent moon to fly asunder. Now, wolf mates, panted Samuel Salt, throwing himself bodily upon the wheel. Horn like a unicorn, branch of the odontosities and... Oh, you don't say it is, chattered Atto, who was lying on his stomach, bouncing up and down like a ball at each frightful lunch of the monstrous fish. Well, it spiked us. Is that a horn or a ship's mast? Oh, whoa, whoa, what insult will we do now? Samuel had not the heart to answer, for he had all he could do to hang on to the wheel as the ship, like a wounded animal, reared and plunged, thrashing the sea to a fury of foam and spray. Nicobo, diving precipitously off her raft, began to squeal in high and low hippopotami, making brave but ineffective lunges at the lashing giant beneath the ship. Sup suppose it submerges, well Atto, who had managed at last to seize a rope from the end of which he banged and slammed continuously up and down against the deck. Oh, my stars, oh, my spars, oh, my beams, and... Tandy never heard Atto's last anguished cry, for at that moment a savage shake of the narwhal's head sent him flying into the sea. Coming up, coughing and choking, Tandy instinctively began to swim, and for the first time became aware of the creeping vine he still had clutched tightly in one hand. And in that instant, and in that world of danger, disaster and destruction, the little boy suddenly grew calm and purposeful. This vine, well... Why would this powerful vine from Pachapani Island not work as well under water as on land? Chances were that it would. Swimming boldly back to the ship, Tandy took a quick dive, hurling the vine pot and all in the general direction of the narwhal. No sooner had the vine touched the water than it began to open, creep and grow. And spraying out a hundred stung tentacles, it seized and bound the plunging monster in a secure and inescapable cradle of leafy wood. Gasping and sputtering, but with his heart pounding with joy to think he had really saved Samuel's beautiful ship, Tandy rose to the surface. Nikobo, letting off shrill blasts of anger and fright, came paddling anxiously toward him. But giving the hippopotamus a reassuring wave, Tandy seized the end of a rope ladder and pulled himself up to the deck. Samuel, though battered and bruised, still clung to the wheel, and Atso, almost bounded to a jelly, had rolled into the scuppers where Roger was fanning him vigorously with a butter paddle. The red bird, having wings, could have left the ship at any time, but had clung bravely to his post, preferring to go down with the ship and his shipmates. Now all three of them stared in dazed silence at Tandy as he climbed back over the rail, for in the terrible confusion and excitement no one had seen him go overboard. Tandy, where you been? With outstretched arms, Samuel Salt rushed groggily forward. Shiver my liver! Why is everything so quiet? Could it be that you single-handed have destroyed that ship-shaking menace? I don't think he's destroyed, Master Salt, answered Tandy, limping happily to meet the captain. But he's caught fast as a lobster in a lobster pot and can't move at all. Caught, rasped Samuel, running across the deck to peer over the rail. By the creeping vine, explained Tandy, and in short, breathless sentences, he told them all that had happened after he was flung into the sea. Well, backpike my mizzen main sails, gasped Samuel Salt, staring at Tandy with round eyes. This is the strangest and happiest day of my life. You've saved the ship and the whole expedition, my boy, and all we have to do now is cut loose from this cavorting unicorn of the sea and sail off with the largest ivory horn in captivity. An ivory mast blast my buckles. Wait till the Osites see us sailing up the Winker River with four masts instead of three. Ahoy below! Ahoy Kobo! Can you dive with me beneath this ship? Dive and stay under as long as you can, vowed the hippopotamus, shaking the water out of her eyes and looking cheerily up at the captain. You see, I was right about those creeping vines, now wasn't I? Nicobo, having done a little investigating on her own account, was well nigh ready to burst with pride at Tandy's quick action and the way in which the vines had overcome their gigantic foe. Right, boomed Samuel Salt, hurrying off for his oxygen helmet and powerful diamond tooth saw. Atta was too bruised and exhausted to rise, but Tandy and Roger, perching on the ship's rail, watched Samuel in his queer diver's helmet climb down the rope ladder and clamber up on the hippopotamus. Next minute, Nicobo had disappeared under the surface, and presently from the slight shiver and shake of the boat, they knew that Samuel was determinately at work cutting them loose. Fortunately, there was room between the ship's bottom and the whale's head for Nicobo to swim about, 
and so splintering sharp was Samuel's saw that in less than five minutes he had cut off the great column of ivory level with the ship's bottom, carefully caulking the edges with material he had brought down. In its tight and live wood crate the narwhal could not stir an inch, and while the cutting of its horn was not painful, it blubbered and spouted so terrifically that Samuel and Nicobo heaved tremendous sighs of relief when the dangerous operation was accomplished. Backing off a few paces, Nicobo began butting the crated sea beast with her head till she had driven it out from beneath the boat. Roger and Tandy, with little shrieks of wonder and excitement, saw the crated fish like some queer and monstrous mummy rise to the surface and go floating sullenly away toward the east. Now that they had a full view of the narwhal, they saw that it was three times the length of the crescent moon. A great wonder Sammy didn't tie it to the ship and tow it along, sighed Ato, who had at last got to his feet and draped himself weakly over the rail. Some fishing, eh, mates? But look at that beautiful mast we have, cried Tandy, waving to Nicobo and the captain as they came cheerfully alongside. Huh, you're as bad as Sammy, grunted Ato, rubbing his bruises sorrowfully. And of course a mast was just what we were needing. Whale of a mast. Mast of a whale. Huh. End of chapter 14「Chapter 15 of Captain Salt in Oz – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fadi Captain Salt in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson Chapter 15 – The Collector is Collected "'What are you going to call this one?' inquired Tandy next morning, as he and Samuel squinted thoughtfully up at the gleaming ivory column between the main and mizzenmasts. "'Might call it the whale-mast,' said Samuel, rubbing his chin reflectively. "'And it's a lucky thing for us the point was sharp enough to cut through the decks without damaging the ship. At any rate, it's given us the biggest fish story a voyager ever had to relate. Tossed on the horn of a narwhale!' And the best part of the whole story is that we have the proof right along with us. Ha! Right here! Samuel, in his glee and exuberance, gave the whale mast a hearty slap. Kobo says that vine won't unwind for a couple of days. But anyway, it'll be a fine rest for the whale, floating round without having to swim. And I expect it can grow another horn? I expect so, agreed Samuel winking down at Sally, who was standing on her head in the bowl of his pipe. If this little lady would just talk, she could give us a heap of valuable information about life in Lava Land, mate. Rogers taught Mofi to say ship ahoy, observed Tandy, strolling over to the rail to watch the white foam sweep past the ship's side. And your sea tree sprays have grown an inch since yesterday, Captain. They have? Samuel blew three rings from his pipe, then walked aft to glance at the compass. Well, my boy, if the rest of the voyage is as good as the beginning, we'll sell home loaded to the gunnels. The mention of home always made Tandy wince, for the crescent moon was the first real home he had known. To think that he would be put ashore in Osmoland, while Samuel's ship would continue its adventurous voyage of discovery without him, was a fact almost too terrible to consider. Maybe we'll never come to Osmalan at all, mused Tandy, as he climbed into the rigging to join Roger. Maybe the captain's reckoning is wrong, and Osmalan is to the north instead of the south. Vastly comforted by this idea, Tandy swung nimbly to the cross tree on the fore to gallant mast. Roger was staring intently through Edo's telescope, and as Tandy squirmed along to a position beside him, the reed bird let out a shrill squall all his head feathers standing straight on end. "'What do you see? What is it?' cried the little king, shading his eyes with his hands and staring in all directions. "'I can't see a thing!' "'Take the glasses!' urged Roger, handing them over with a frightened gulp. "'Take the glasses, and then tell me it isn't so!' Tandy, scarcely knowing what to expect, screwed his eye close to the telescope. Then he too gave a shriek of consternation. Why, it's a b big hole, a hole in the sea, he stuttered, lowering the glasses and staring at the reed bird in blank dismay. Exactly, 
croaked the reed bird. And whoever heard of such a thing? A hole in the ground, certainly, but a hole in the sea? Why, that's just plain past believing. Ahoy! Deck ahoy! Wagging his head, Roger lifted his voice in a long warning wail. Heave to, Master Salt! Heave to! Danger on the bow! Somewhat surprised, but without stopping to question Roger, in whom he had the utmost confidence, Samuel hove his vessel to, and not a moment too soon, for barely a ship's length away yawned an immense and unexplainable hole in the sea. Round its edges the waves frothed, tossed and bubbled, making no impression on that quiet, curious vacuum of air. Crowding into the bow, the ship's company stared down in complete wonder and mystification. Now, goose wing my topsails! This'll bear looking into, puffed Samuel, breaking the silence at last. No, no, no! Ado snatched wildly at Samuel's coattails as he raced aft, bellowing loudly for Kobo to come alongside. You'll not go a step off this boat. We can sail round this air hole and no damage done. But as for looking into it, help, help! Avast and belay, and I'll knock eight bells out of anyone who leaves this ship. Seizing an iron belaying pin, Ado made a desperate rush after Samuel Salt, and failing to catch him before he slid down the cable to Kobo's raft, he grabbed Tandy firmly and angrily by the seat of the pants. Not a step, panted the ship's cook savagely. Not a step. Roger, Roger, come back here this instant. But Roger, with a screech of defiance, had already flown after Samuel. Tandy, pinned against the rail by Ado's 250 pounds, was forced to watch Nikobo with Roger and Samuel on her back moving cautiously toward the edge of the air hole. Over his shoulder, Samuel had a huge coil of rope, the end of which he had attached to the capstan of the boat before he dropped over the side. Oh, oh, and oh, wheezed the ship's cook. If Sammy goes down that cavern, we're as good as lost. No one to navigate, to upsail or downsail, or lay to in a storm. My, my, and my land. Well, there he goes, cried Tandy, as Samuel flung the rope down into the sea hole. Don't worry, Ado. He's always come back before, hasn't he? Let me go. Let me go, I tell you. With a sudden jerk, Tandy tore out of Ado's grasp, climbed up on the rail, and dove into the sea. Swimming rapidly toward the hippopotamus, he climbed on her back, and with Roger fluttering in excited circles overhead, Nikobo swam as close to the edge of the sea hole as she dared watching in terrified fascination as Samuel calmly lowered himself into the clouded blue depths. With mingled feelings of interest and alarm, Tandy saw the royal explorer of Oz go down lower and lower and finally disappear altogether into the deep blue air below. Now not a glimpse of Samuel was visible and not a sound came up to reassure them that he was still there. I'll just fly down and see what's up, quavered Roger and in spite of the loud shouts and threats of Edo on the crescent moon, the reed bird spread his wings and coasted slowly and bravely into the immense air shaft. Nikobo, now as alarmed as a ship's cook, began swimming frantically round the edge of the misty chasm, letting out piercing blasts that sounded like nothing so much as a ferry boat whistle. Tandy himself felt uneasy and frightened, and Edo, unable to bear the suspense any longer, climbed over the side and came swimming out to join them. After an endless fifteen minutes, during which dreadful fear and premonition gripped the watchers, the head of the reed bird popped mournfully into view. Is he all right? Where's Sammy? What in soup's he doing? What'd you find out? gasped Ado, reaching out to clutch Roger by the wing. Roger, limp and bedraggled, with all the stiffness out of his feathers, said nothing for a whole minute. Then, beating his wings together, he began to scream out hoarsely, the captain's caught. The collector's collected. They have Master Salt forty fathom below. They've got him shut up. I mean, down at the bottom of the sea, like a goldfish in a bowl, only he's in a big bowl of air. They're poking little fish and crabs through a trap door in the air shaft, and I cannot break or even make a dent in the transparent slide they've shot across the air hole to shut him off from us. And oh, my bill and feathers... Every time they open the trap door to shove things into him, water rushes into the vacuum. He's standing in water to his knees now, 
and unless we can break a hole in that lid, the captain's done for. Done for, do you hear? They? asked Tandy, while Nakobo's eyes almost popped out of her head. Who do you mean? Oh, oh, don't ask me, choked the poor reed bird. They're not fish, and they're not men. They're about the size of Tandy here, sort of stiff and jellied and perfectly transparent. On a shell hanging outside one of their caves, it said Sea Ouija. Sea Ouija? moaned Edo, clutching his head in both hands. Let me see, let me see. What's to be done, boys? Now quick, what's to be done? Have Roger fetch the saw we used on the whale's horn, gurgled Nikobo. And I'll climb down and saw a hole in that slide, cried Tandy eagerly. No, I'll climb down, said Ado firmly. I've known Sammy the longest, and if he's going to come to a watery end, I might as well end with him. Leaving the two arguing, Roger flashed back to the ship, returning in almost no time with a scintillating and powerful saw. Tandy had meanwhile convinced Ado that he could climb down the rope faster, being so much lighter. And now, with tears in their eyes, Nikobo and the ship's cook saw Tandy and Roger disappear into the air shaft. Tandy let himself down carefully, hand over hand, Roger keeping abreast of him with the saw. To slide rapidly to the bottom would have been quicker, but the resulting blisters would make it difficult to use the saw. Forty fathoms, nearly two hundred and forty feet, is a long way to go hand over hand on a rope, and before he reached the glass-like slide, Tandy's palms stung and his shoulders ached and burned from the strain. But at last he was down, and dropping to his hands and knees with Roger mourning and muttering beside him, Tandy peered fearfully through the glassy substance. For a moment everything was a green and misty blur, but gradually the figure of Samuel Salt standing sturdily in the middle of the air bowl became visible. Although waist-high in seawater, and surrounded by loathsome sea creatures and crabs the sea Ouijians had tossed in for him to eat, Samuel was making slow and interested entries in his journal. Pressed against the sides of his strange aquarium, Tandy could see the round square and triangular faces of the jellyfish men and women. Brilliantly colored vines and seaweed waved and tossed in the current. The floor of the ocean was covered with bright shells, polished stones, and all manner of sparkling deep-sea jewels. Had Tandy not been so worried about Samuel Salt, he would have liked nothing better than sketching this strange and beautiful undersea kingdom, with the sea Ouijians flopping and swimming busily in and out of their grottoes and caves, or disporting themselves in the seaweed forests. But as it was, his only thought was of quickly freeing the captain of the crescent moon from his curious prison. Look, they've put up a sign! hissed Roger, handing over the saw. Looking in the direction indicated by Roger, Tandy saw an immense shell on which long wisps of seaweed had been arranged to form the words, Come see the curious high air manster. Admission, one pearl, five corals, and a clam. The sight of this sign swinging from a small sea tree close to Samuel's air bowl sent a wave of rage up Tandy's back. Rubbing his palms briskly together, the little boy seized the saw and struck it with all his might against the unyielding surface of the slide. The noise attracted Samuel's attention, and looking up he began waving his arms, yelling out wild orders and commands. Not being able to hear any of them, and being quite sure Samuel was telling them to leave the air shaft before the sea Ouijians shot another slide above their heads and caught them too, Tandy proceeded grimly with his task. Roger helped, scraping away with both claws and bill. For five desperate minutes, they worked without success. Then a tiny crack split the slide from edge to edge. Wedging the saw into the narrow opening, Tandy began sawing away like a little wild man, for a fresh batch of snails and crabs, tossed into Samuel, had let in another rush of seawater. Immersed to his chin, Samuel started to swim round and round, dodging the end of the saw as it flashed up and down above his head. Oh! gasped Tandy, stopping a moment to blow on his fingers. I'll never be able to make this opening large enough. Look, look, Roger. They're opening that trap door again. Oh, oh, I can't bear it. Help! Help! yelled the reed bird, looking despairingly up the empty air shaft. Help! For the love of sea salt and sailor men! 
his cry, increased by the curious nature of the compressed air in the air shaft, increased a hundredfold, and fell with a hideous roar upon the anguished ears of Edo and Nikobo. Almost instinctively and without thought of her own safety, or Edo's, or the dire consequences, the hippopotamus jumped bodily into the sea hole. Roger, still glaring upward, had a quick flash of an immense falling object. Realizing at once what had happened, the reed bird had just time to snatch Tandy and drag him to the opposite side of the slide before Nikobo landed, broke through the thick glass, plunged into Samuel's aquarium, and shot out through the side into a group of horrified Seaweegians. Now do not suppose for an instant that Tandy, Roger, or Samuel himself saw all this happen. Indeed, after Nikobo struck the slide, none of them remembered a thing, for the ocean, rushing in through the puncture the hippopotamus had made in the vacuum, rose like a tidal wave, carrying them tumultuously along. Nikobo came up at a little distance from the others, with Edo, completely wrapped and entangled in seaweed, clinging tenaciously to her harness, and looking like some queer marine specimen himself. Too shocked and stunned to swim, the five shipmates bobbed up and down like corks on the surface of the sea. Then Roger, spreading his wet and bedraggled wings and coughing violently from all the salt water he had swallowed, started dizzily back to the crescent moon. Nikobo had several long gashes in her tough hide, but still managed to grin at Tandy. I, I must have lost a saw, panted the little boy, pulling himself warily up on her back. Never mind the saw. I still have my journal, and look what I caught, puffed Samuel Salt, dragging himself up on the other side of the hippopotamus. Ship ahoy, mates! A live and perfect specimen of a jellyfish boy! Holding up his prize, Samuel smiled blandly, all his danger and discomfort apparently forgotten. Oh, my eyes, ears, and whiskers! quavered Edo, peering out of his net of seaweed. Is it for this we've been scraping our noses on the sea bottom? Nodding cheerfully, Samuel plunged the squirming and transparent little water boy under the surface, holding him there, as Nikobo swam slowly and painfully back to the ship. End of chapter 15、Chapter、of Captain Salt in Oz This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pseudonymous Nerd in Mumbai, India. Captain Salt in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter 16 The Storm. Tandy was so exhausted. From his dreadful experiences at the bottom of the sea hole, he spent the rest of the morning flat on his stomach on deck, making lively sketches from memory of the city of Seawegia. Of the sea hole itself, not a sign or vestige remained. The sea, tumbling through the breach made by Nikobo, had closed it up forever and ever. Ato and Roger. Fetch bandages while Witch Hazel down to the raft, and it took him two hours to bind up the cuts and hurts of the faithful hippopotamus. Then, climbing wearily up the rope ladder to the deck, he spent the other hour rubbing himself with oil and liniment, muttering darkly about reckless collectors who got themselves and their shipmate collected. What would we have done? If you never got out of the air bowl, scolded Atto, waving the bottle of liniment at the captain, who was cheerfully changing into dry clothes. You know I know nothing about navigation, no one sail from the other. Aha, but you know about sauces, retorted Samuel, with rolling his eyes rapturously. Of course, I'll grant the ship that cannot sail on its stomach. But if the worst had come to the worst, you could have left a note for the sails or the binnacle. If it comes to a blow, tie yourselves up. Ha ha, tie yourselves up! Jamming his feet into his boots, Samuel blew a kiss to his still muttering shipmate and trampled down to the hole to settle his jellyfish boy 
in one of the large aquariums. The water boy, about half the size of Tandy, was jolly enough looking specimen, but kept opening and shutting his mouth like a fish, staring anxiously from his captor to Mofi in the cage opposite. Whistling happily and unmindful of the cuts and bruises he had suffered. Samuel filled the bottom of the aquarium with pebbles and shells, put in several seaweed plants he'd fished up in the nets, and soon had the little stranger as happy and cozy as a clam. Giving him and Mofi a wafer of fish food, the royal explorer of Oz went above to have a look at the weather, for he did not like the way the ship was pitching. In spite of the desperately fatiguing morning they had had, it seemed the voyagers were in for some further excitement. The sky had grown dark and threatening. Dark clouds in the ever-increasing numbers scudded along from the east. The sea, rough and angry, was full of racing little white caps. <laughs> the Kobo's raft plunged up and rocketed up and down like a bucking bronco flinging the hippopotamus from side to side and bringing her with squealing protests up against the rail, first on one side and then on the other. Fearing for safety, Samuel, with Tandy's help, rigged a temporary derrick to the mizzenmast to have his vessel too, and bidding the kobo swam around to the side, cleverly hoisted to the main deck and by a hook caught her through the harness. The kobo took it all quite calmly, coming down with a thankful little grunt, glad to be with the ship's mates in the gale that was lashing in the sea into a roaring, tossing fury of mounting grey water and foam. The wind had risen now to almost hurricane proportions, and taking in all sail and with only a tarpaulin slashed in the main rigging, Samuel prepared to with bare poles ride out into the storm. At home, always ready and helpful in a crisis, trudged up and down on the heaving decks with pails of hot soup and coffee. Mmm! And after a hasty lunch, all hands fell to the closing ports, battening hatches and removing from decks all loose gear and equipment. As it was impossible to shove Nikobo through the door of the main cabin, Samuel lashed her tightly to the mizzenmast and with an old sail round her shoulders, the hippopotamus anxiously watched the mountainous waves breaking over the bow and running into the scuppers. It was all so wild and new, so dangerous and exciting. Tandy begged Samuel to let him stay on deck. Much against his better judgment, Samuel finally gave his consent. Tying Tandy fast to Nikobo and the mizzenmast. If anything happened to the ship, reflected Samuel, fighting his way back to the wheel. The hippopotamus could keep Tandy afloat and take care of him besides. A toe and Roger not being needed on deck and not really caring for shams, shut themselves up in the main cabin for a game of checkers. But checkers and board soon flew through the air, and the two had to stand hang on to their chairs as the crescent moon pitched headlong into the cavernous hollows and struggled up against the mountainous ridges of the great running seas. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of Captain Salt and Oz This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Salt and Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson Chapter 17 The Old Man of the Jungle In the splendid white marble palace in the splendid white city of Azamaland, the nine Osmondarans sat in solemn conference. This time we have succeeded, stated Dijabu, chief of the nine judges of the realm. This time we have succeeded, and our plans may now be accomplished. Last time we merely destroyed the king and queen, neglecting to do away with the royal offspring, Tazander Taza, and for that reason we failed utterly. So long as this boy survived, the natives insisted on considering him their rightful king and ruler. But ha! That prophecy we invented 
about an aunt carrying him off was a clever and useful idea. Eh, my fellow Zamians? Now, as a child, with a little help on our part, it must be confessed, has really been carried off and destroyed. We can blame these same silly females, and they and all the royal family can be tossed into the sea to pay for this heinous crime. Ha <laughs> ha! Quite an idea, a famous idea, murmured Dijabu. And the eight Osmondarans nodded their narrow heads in complete and satisfied agreement. Leaving the throne clear for us, the nine faithful servants of the people. Again the Osmondarans nodded, but Dijabu, slanting his cruel little eyes up and down the long table, was already making plans to destroy the lot of them and have the whole great country for himself. But how can we be sure the boy is destroyed and out of the way? questioned Lotho, the second Osmondaran in point of rank and power. Because, Dijabu curled up his lips in a hard little smile. The old man of the jungle has brought us proof. Boglador! Boglador! It is our wish that you appear before us! At Dijabu's call, there was a slight rustle and stir behind the curtains in the doorway, and an immense wrinkled old native, clad only in a turban and loincloth, stepped noiselessly into the chamber of justice. Without waiting for further orders, Boglador began in a high, dismal, droning voice. Following the commands of the highest among you, I, Boglador the magician, did carry off on my famous, never known or seen flying umbrellaphant, the heir and small king of this country, coming down after two days on Patripany Island. Not wishing to destroy the boy with my own hands, I left him to the wild beasts and savage leopard men known to inhabit this island. That, as you know, was five months and two weeks ago. Having just returned from a second flight to the island, where I found no trace or sign of the boy, I can safely assure you that he is no more, that he has undoubtedly been killed by the savages or the wild beasts of the jungle. There was not a trace of pity or remorse on the cruel flat faces of his listeners as Boglador finished his shameful recital. In that case, there is nothing left to do but punish the royal aunts and family, issue a proclamation of our accession to power, and divide up the kingdom, mused Lotho, drumming thoughtfully on the table with his long, skinny fingers. But do not forget my reward, wheezed Boglador firmly. For this cruel and infamous deed, I was promised one-tenth of Osmaland, and I am here to claim as my share the entire jungle reach of this country. Extending his arms, the old man of the jungle advanced threateningly toward the long table. Ha ha! Just listen to him now, sneered Dijabu, gathering up his papers and looking insolently across at the angry native. Have a care what you say, fellow. Too much of this and you'll go over the cliff with the royal relatives. Now then, clear out. Your work is done. If you ever set foot in this city again, you shall be trampled beneath the feet of the royal elephants. Ah! Boglador recoiled, as if he had been confronted by a poisonous reptile. So that's to be the way of it? Aha! Very good. I will go. But do not think this is the end. It is but the beginning. Snapping his fingers under the long noses of the Osmondarans, the old man, not bothering with the door, leapt out the window and vanished into the garden. Do you think that was quite wise? questioned Thibaut, third in rank of the Osmondarans. This fellow and his flying elephants are dangerous and may do us a world of harm. Do not forget, anything he says will involve himself, and he'll have a hard time proving to the people that it was on my orders the young king was carried off. Oh, hush, warned Lotho, glancing nervously over his shoulder. Not another word. Shrugging his shoulders and rising to indicate that the meeting was over, Dijabu started pompously for the door. I will go now to prepare a royal proclamation, explaining that as a young king has not after exhaustive search been found or located, the authority and governing power of the state shall pass to us.
the nine faithful Osmanderans of the realm. We can then meet again, and here in this star and barred chamber of justice, divide the kingdom among us. Very well, but see that you remember it is to be divided. Staring fixedly at Dijabu, Lotho strode away, colliding violently at the door with a small, breathless page who was entering on a veritable gallop. Your honors, your Osmandaran majesties, shrilled the boy, wildly waving his trumpet instead of blowing upon it. A ship! There is a ship with four masts beneath the chalk cliffs. A strange ship with full sail is riding into our harbor. There, there, don't shout, snapped Dijabu, seizing the boy roughly by the shoulders. Go back at once and discover what flag this ship flies from her masthead. Quickly now, run! What could it mean? Where could it be from? Such a thing has never happened before, muttered the others, hastening over to the long windows. Confoundation! raged Dijabu, as the page, with frightened stutters, turned and ran out of the Hall of Justice. This ruins everything. Who are these meddling foreigners? And why do they have to arrive now of all times? Now, Lotho, Tebow, call out the Camel Corps and the White Elephant Guard. Have them drawn up in war formation on the chalk cliffs. You others! Impatiently, Dijabu waved his arms at the six remaining Osmandarans. See to the defense of the palace. If these meddlers set foot upon our territory, they are to be trampled upon. Trampled upon! Do you understand? Nodding with fierce and cruel determination, the eight tall keepers of the White City set about carrying out Dijabu's orders. Dijabu hurrying up to the highest tower in the castle, looked through his telescope to see what manner of ship had come sailing out of the west to spoil or postpone his well-laid plans. End of chapter 17。Chapter 18 of Captain Salt in Oz。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Salt in Oz by Ruth Plumlee Thompson Chapter 18 A New Country Driven by the pitiless wind, pounded by the merciless sea, the crescent moon rode before the gale, coming toward morning into quiet waters at last. The sky, now pale gray instead of black, showed a small single star in the east, and with a huge sigh of weariness and relief, Samuel let go the anchor and bade his crew turn in all standing. This they were only too glad to do, sleeping heavily and thankfully in their clothes. Nicobo still wrapped in her sails, snoring like a whole band of music beneath the mizzenmast. Tandy, to whom the storm had been a thrilling adventure, was the first to waken. Still stiff and bruised from the pounding he had taken as the crescent moon tossed and pitched in the terrible seas, he sprang eagerly out of his bunk, curious to know where the storm had carried them. The morning mists, lifting like a shimmering veil or the curtain of a stage on some so new and strange scene, showed a long white line of chalk cliffs to the east, and beyond the cliffs the dim outline of a great and splendid city. With joy and lively expectations, Tandy had run out on deck, but now, after a long look over the port rail, he crept silently and soberly back to his cabin, closing the door softly behind him. Later, as the sun rose higher and his shipmates awoke, the excited screams of Nicobo and Roger and the eager voices of Samuel and Atto told him that they too had seen the bright land beyond the cliffs. Already Samuel was clearing up his sail, and above the rattle in the rigging, Tandy could hear the rasp of the anchor cable as it came winding over the side. But he only bent lower over the fat book in his lap. And when the reed bird, loudly calling his name, came hurtling through the porthole, he did not even look up. Land! Land and more land! croaked Roger, dancing up and down on the foot of the bunk. None of your pesky islands this time, but a whole long new continent. What insults the matter, youngster? This is no time to be a reading. Come on, come on, the captain's looking for you. As Roger peered sharply down at the book in Tandy's lap, two tears splashed on the open page. 
Quickly brushing two more off his nose, the ship's cabin boy unwillingly met the puzzled gaze of the Reed Bird. Roger, demanded Tandy in a smothered and unsteady voice, which is most important, being a king or being a person? Roger, his head on one side, considered this for a moment, and then spoke quickly. Well, you can't be a good king without being a good person, so I should say being a good person is most important. But it says here, with a furious sniff, Tandy put his finger on the middle paragraph of the page, In no circumstances and for no reason may a king forsake his country nor desert his countrymen. What's that? What is this? Huh. Maxims for monarchs. Well, what in top sales do we care for that musty volume? Giving the book a vicious shove, Roger, forgetting how much he had formerly praised Atto's fat volume, fluttered down on Tandy's shoulder. So that's it, he burst out explosively. This pernicious country yonder is Ozamaland. Well, we can't spare you and that's final. They didn't know how to treat a good king when they had one. Now let them practice on somebody else. Say the word, my lad, and we'll put about and sail away as fast as a good ship can take us. Captain, Master Salt, deck ahoy, all hands ahoy. Without waiting for Tandy's answer, Roger skimmed through the port and winged over to the captain. Wait, wait, sputtered Tandy, hurrying aft where the officers and crew of the Crescent Moon were now engaged in earnest conversation. Don't you remember you wanted some of those creeping birds and flying reptiles, Captain? Well, this is the place, puffed the little boy, waving his arm toward the cliffs. This is the Zamaland, and I've got to go ashore. It's really all right, he continued earnestly as Samuel began unhappily rubbing his chin. It's been a grand voyage, and I've learned a lot, but a king has to stick to his post, hasn't he? Not all the time, snapped Atto, giving his belt an indignant jerk. You stuck to your post, and then they stuck you in a tower, and then in a pig pen in the jungle. So what do you owe them? Nothing, says I. Absolutely nothing. But Samuel Salt, regretfully as he was to lose this handy young artist and cabin boy, felt that Tandy must decide the matter for himself. If you are as good a king as you are a seaman, I'm not the one to hold you back, he sighed sorrowfully. But just let these lovers start any more nonsense, and I'll give them a taste of the rope. Ha! I will not be leaving you till everything's shipshape, and you can lay to that. I'm not leaving you at all, snorted Nikobo, lumbering hugely over to Tandy and almost flattening him against the port rail. I'll miss this ship worse than the river and Atta's cooking and the captain's stories and Roger's jokes, but wherever Tandy goes, I go, and that's flat. Just plain noddling nonsense putting him ashore, fumed Atto angrily. He's not old enough to manage these wild tribesmen and scheming aristocrats. Besides, we need him on this expedition, and you know it. Samuel, sighing deeply, smiled at Tandy, and Tandy, sighing just as deeply, smiled back. Never you mind promised the former pirate with a wink that somehow lacked conviction. There will be other voyages. And seizing the wheel, he began tacking in toward Tandy's homeland. But he had lost all pleasure and interest in charting for the first time on any map the long continent of Tarara and adding strange animals and plants to his ever-growing collection. Losing Tandy spoiled the whole expedition for him and by taking longer and wider tacks, he delayed their landing to the latest possible moment. But at last, there they were, in the very shadow of the chalk cliffs, and with no further excuse for not going ashore. Nikobo had agreed to carry them and had abruptly heaved herself overboard, sending up a fountain of spray as high as the ship itself when she struck the water, thus astonishing to no end the watchers on the bank. Tandy, after running down to the hall to say goodbye to Morphy and have a last look at the jellyfish boy, regretfully joined the others at the port rail. Having brought nothing aboard the crescent moon, he insisted on leaving the same way, soberly waving aside all the gifts and presents Atzo and Samuel sought to press upon him. Clad only in the leopard skin he had worn on Patrapani Island, he swung nimbly down the rope ladder, the captain and the cook, in honor of Tandy's homecoming, had donned their finest shore-going togs, and Samuel, with his scimitar in his teeth, and Atto, armed as usual with his spirit knife and a package he refused to explain, followed him more slowly down the ladder. Then they all climbed aboard the hippopotamus. 
Roger, flying ahead with some Oz flags just for luck, could not help comparing the brown, hard-muscled young seaman with the skinny, fretful boy they had taken on a Patrippany Island. Trying to comfort himself with Tandy's improved health and spirits, he looked curiously at the great company assembled on the cliffs. All of the nobles and their families, in flowing white robes, were present, and many of the immense turbaned tribesmen who happened to be in the capital had gathered to see for themselves the first ship that had ever touched the shore of Osamaland. Beyond the nobles and natives, Roger could see row on row of white guards mounted on enormous white elephants and snow-white camels. "'Trouble, trouble, nothing but trouble,' mourned the reed bird dreadfully to himself. Tandy, familiar with the whole coast, guided Nikobo to the only possible spot for landing, and grunting and mumbling, the hippopotamus hauled herself up on the rocks, glancing sharply and suspiciously at the little boy's subjects. A narrow path wound and curved up through the cliffs, and puffing and panting, Nikobo finally made her way to the top, where she stood uncertainly facing the milling multitude. "'Hail and greetings,' called Samuel Salt raising his arm to attract their attention, for the crowd looked both dangerous and unfriendly. "'We are here to return to you safe and sound your lost king, Tazander Tazar, rescued by us from the wild jungle of Pachipani Island.' "'King! King!' shrilled a dozen shrill and unbelieving voices. "'Where, where?' And everyone craned his neck to get a better view of Nikobo and her three curious riders. Is it really our lost and stolen kinglet? Yes, cried Tandy, springing erect. I am Tazanda Tazar, king's son and son of a king's son. You are my lawful subjects, and Ozamalan is my kingdom. A little shiver of excitement ran through the crowd at these words. He does in truth resemble our young ruler, murmured one noble to another, though much stronger and more bold. Drawing a long sword, he waved it imperiously above his head. Summon the other mandarins, he called loudly. They will decide whether this be our king or some small impostor, and death to all strangers and enemies who come in ships to lay waste our realm. Oh, hold your tongue, advised Atto, selling himself more comfortably between Nicobo's shoulders. Who are you to challenge the royal explorer of Oz, the king of the octagon isle? And his royal reed bird, piped Roger, flying savagely round and round the head of the speaker. Yes, who are you to challenge the rightful ruler of Ozamaland? cried Tandy, folding his arms and gazing calmly out over the curious throng. Hi, is this the young slip they kept locked in the tower? Hoo hoo! yelled an old tribesman, brandishing his long lance. He's the salt of the sea and the sand of the desert. Shame on you, Zaman, not to recognize and welcome your young king. I am for you, young one, down to my last breath. In spite of these brave words, the nobles, natives and guards made no move or motion to let Nicobo pass through. Then suddenly there was a break in the crowd, and the nine square-hatted Azamandarins stepped rigidly forward. And nine taller, thinner, meaner visage rogues, decided Samuel, lovingly fingering his scimitar, it had never been his misfortune to encounter. Didjabo, recognizing Tandy at once in spite of his new and seaman-like bearing, was the first to speak. "'The blessing of the stars, moon and sun upon you!' cried the wily chief, bowing rapidly ten times in succession. "'And upon these strangers who have brought you safely back to these shores. Welcome, most welcome, small king, and ruler of the Ozamanders!' Speaking calmly but with black fury in his heart to have his plan so unexpectedly thwarted, Didjabo advanced rapidly toward Nikobo. And now that you are here and be really safe, we must see that you are locked securely in the white tower of the wise man, away from all future hurt and harm. Reaching the side of the hippopotamus, he put up his hand to help Tandy dismount. But I'm not going back to the tower, said Tandy, looking the chief Ozamandarin straight in the eye. Ever. I'm riding on to the castle, so kindly order some refreshments for my friends and shipmates. Hi, ay, ay, approved the old tribesman, pounding the cliff with his lance. Here's a king for us. What good did your tower do before, old square hat? He was carried off in spite of it, wasn't he? Well, trot along now and do as he says. He is the king, and I'm here to see he gets his rights. 
shocked by the determination in Tandy's voice and the evident delight of the crowd at his defiance, Didjabo put up his hand for silence. It is the law of the land that the nine Ozamandarins shall guard the life and preserve the health of the country's sovereign, stated Didjabo in his cold and impressive voice. Until this boy becomes of age, he must be cared for and protected from his enemies. Forward, guards, on to the tower. You others, Didjabo nodded disagreeably at Samuel Salt, Aldo, Roger, and Nicobo. You others may return to your ship, where a suitable reward will be sent out to you. We are deeply indebted to you for finding our king, but the law of Ozamaland says that all foreigners landing on our shores shall instantly and without delay be flung over the cliffs. In your case, we graciously permit you to leave. Come, Tazanda. While Samuel Salt could not help admiring the way the old Ozamandarin was trying to keep the upper hand, he had no intention of believing that he had assured himself that Tandy was in safe and proper hands. But surely you will wish to hear the story of how we found this boy and explain how he happened to be on that jungle island, observed Samuel mildly. Step back, my good fellow. Nicobo has large feet and she just might happen to trade on you. Yes, wheezed Nicobo suddenly. I just might happen to do that very thing. Slipping round to the other side of the hippopotamus, Didjabo, paying no attention to either remark, tried to pull Tandy to the ground. But the little boy, remembering Roger's advice about lovers, gave him a fast and sudden poke in the nose that sent his hat flying off and the other mandarin himself rolling head over heels. Hooray, hooray, a vast and belay, and down with old square hats forever, shrilled the reed bird, while Asu and Samuel exchanged a proud and pleased glance. While the other as a mandarin stood uncertainly, the crowd, long weary of the rigid rule of the nine judges, began to laugh and cheer. "'The king is king! Long live the king!' shouted the old tribesman vociferously. But Didjabo, pulling himself furiously to his feet, flung up his arm. "'Guards! Guards!' he screeched venomously. "'Do your work! Save this poor misguided child from these unspeakable foreigners, or we are all lost! Can you not see their savages, sorcerers, and enemies?' Seize the king and over the cliff with these hippopotamic invaders. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of Captain Salt in Oz This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Salt in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson Chapter 19 Boglador's Revenge The word hippopotamic seemed to rouse the undecided guards to action, and Samuel, as the crowd moved uneasily aside to let the elephant and camel-mounted guardsmen through, heartily wished himself back on the ship. Nicobo, squeeding with rage and defiance, began moving cautiously back toward the path down the cliffs, but Atto, who had been merely biding his time, tore open his package and began tossing right and left the tumbleweeds and creeping vines which fortunately it had contained. The first creeper caught Dijabo, bound him up and laid him by the heels before he could issue another order. Taking careful aim, Atta threw a creeping vine at each of the other as a mandarins. The tumbleweeds, whirling beneath the feet of the elephants and camels, caused them to fall to their knees tossing their riders over their heads, and between the yells of the guards, the squeals of the camels, and the trumpeting of the elephants, confusion was terrific. The natives and nobles, and all who could still move or run, set off at top speed for the city without once looking behind them. Muttering angrily under his breath, Atta continued to hurl vines and tumbleweeds till none was left. Unable to advance an inch, the white guard and their mounts rolled and groveled together in the deep sand. Now we can go to the palace, cried Tandy, a bit breathless by the suddenness of it all. Oh, Atto, how did you ever happen to bring those plants along? I suspected some of these subjects of yours were villains, answered Atto grimly, and the only way to meet villains is with villainy. Forward march, my lass, on to the king's castle. Picking her way around the fallen men and beasts, Nicobo, snorting at each step to show her superiority and contempt, set out for the royal palace. Of all the people who had run out on the cliffs, 
besides the securely bound Ozamandarins and the guard, only the old tribesman who had first cheered Tandy remained. "'Oh, please do come with us,' invited Tandy earnestly as the old man stepped smilingly out of Nikobo's way. "'You could tell me all about the tent-dwellers and help me so much if you would.' "'I am Charnam, the Sheik, head of a thousand tribes and speaking for them. "'I can say they all will proudly and gladly serve your brave young majesty. "'Too long have the city-dwellers ruled this great liberty-loving land.' "'Then over the side and under the hatches with him!' cried Roger, beside himself with joy and exuberance at the neat way Atto had handled Tandy's subjects. "'This boy is an able-bodied seaman and explorer, and will stand no nonsense!' "'My sea is the desert,' said Chunum, striding jauntily along beside Nicobo. "'And my ship is a camel, but I'll wake our we'll understand each other well enough for all that.' To Tandy, conversing eagerly with Chunum, the splendor of the white city of Om was an old story, but to the others it seemed, with its flashing marble walks, great waving palms, and towering dwellings and castle, one of the loveliest capitals they had yet visited. Word of the happenings on the cliff had travelled fast. Longing to welcome the young king, but fearing the strange magicians who had come with him, the nobles had barred themselves in their fine houses, and the natives had fled to the hills beyond the city gates. The many-domed marble palace was absolutely deserted when Nicobo pushed her way through the wide doors. Not a footman, page, or courtier was in sight. Seeing no attention or service was to be had for some time, Atta hurried away to the kitchens and was soon happily at work preparing a splendid feast to celebrate Tandy's homecoming. Tandy himself felt quiet and sad examining with scant interest and enthusiasm the splendid rooms which he had never yet been allowed to live in. To tell the truth, he would have traded the whole castle for his small cabin aboard Samuel's ship. Samuel himself, never really happy or comfortable ashore, wandered around aimlessly, opening books on the long tables, peering out windows, and finally settling with a sigh of resignation in a huge chair beside the throne. Nicobo had found a long pool and fountain in the same room, and lying at full length in this luxuriant marble bath, tranquilly waited for events to shape themselves. "'Why not sit on your throne?' asked Roger, as Tandy seated himself on a small stool beside Samuel Salt. "'Oh, it's much too big for me,' sighed Tandy, thinking how very big and lonely the palace would seem when all his shipmates had gone. "'Aho, methinks you're right!' Ahoy, the beginning of a beautiful idea doth at this moment start to seep through the head feathers of which more anon. Chunum, who had never before heard a bird talk, stared at Roger in amazed interest and surprise, but giving him no more satisfaction than a mischievous wink, the reed bird flew off to help Atta with the dinner. And now Samuel proceeded to tell the old tribesman how he had found Tandy in the jungle, imprisoned in the wooden cage. As he finished, Chunum shook his head in stern displeasure. It has been long my conviction and belief, he stated solemnly, that the Ozamandarins are at the bottom of this. Every year they usurp more and more power, and keeping the young king shut up in the tower was but an excuse to give them their own will and way. Nor can I believe that the royal parents of this boy accidentally fell into the sea as they were reported to have done or that the young aunts mentioned in the prophecy had anything at all to do with Tandy's abduction. Tell me how long will the vines hold those villains prisoner, for only that long is Tazando safe. We must think and act quickly, said Chanum, tapping his staff thoughtfully on the floor. The vines will not unwind for two days, and before then, ha! Samuel expelled his breath in a mighty blast and sprang purposefully to his feet. Before then, we shall put those fellows in a very safe place for Tandy and for them too. Shiver me timbers. Taking Chunum by the shoulder, Samuel started toward the door, and seeing the two intended to leave the castle, Nicobo climbed out of the fountain and offered to carry them. Tandy nodded absently as the two left the castle, his thoughts still far away on the crescent moon, and considering the work they had to do, Samuel and Chunum were well pleased to leave him behind. With surprising speed, the hippopotamus made the return trip to the cliffs. The effects of the tumbleweed had evidently worn off, and the guards on their mounts had fled with the rest of the inhabitants of White City to the hills. But the nine other mandarins still lay in their curious cradles in the deep coarse sand. As Samuel and Chunum, in absolute agreement as to what should be done, 
rolled off Nikobo's back, a furious bellow and screech brought them up short. Nikobo, startled out of her usual calm, fell on her haunches and after one horrified look upward, buried her head in the sand. It can't be, cried Samuel, clutching Chairman's sleeve. It can't be, but it is. An elephant, a flying elephant, panted Chunum, dragging Samuel from under the immense shadow. Flatten yourself in the sand, seamen, and we may yet be spared. As Samuel, more amazed than scared at so strange and curious a specimen, and even vaguely hopeful of capturing the unwieldy creature, made no move, Chunum dragged him down by main force. The elephant, meanwhile, lighted like some gigantic butterfly on the edge of the cliff. Fairly bleating with fright and terror, the nine other mandarins watched him swooping toward them with a sinister and soundless speed. Just behind his ear perched Boglador, the old man of the jungle, looking cruel and ugly as the genie of all evil. Revenge! Revenge! shrilled the turban native, clenching his fists. Now shall Boglador have his reward! Addressing himself to Chunum and Samuel Salt, the old man of the jungle began screaming out the story of his wrongs. For these scheming rascals I carried away an umbo, my great and useful umbrella fan, the young king of this country. For this I was to receive one-tenth of the kingdom, the Ozamandarins themselves to divide the rest of the country among them. But ha! What happened? Dancing up and down on the elephant's head, Boglodo again clenched his fists his face distorted with rage and fury. What happened? Why, these miserable cheats refused to pay me, intended to keep the whole country for themselves. But here can well, you and you, jerking his thumb contemptuously toward his rigid and helpless enemies, the old man continued his story. All along I have suspected these thieving Zamans. All along I intended to fool them and return the little king to his castle, keeping only the jungle for my own. That is why I built the boy his cage in the jungle and set Nicobo, the great hippopotamus, to watch over him, giving her the power of speech and the desire to seek out and protect this unfortunate child of an unfortunate country. I am a magician and could well bring about these things. You, whoever you are, who found and brought him back to Azamalan, did no more than I myself intended to do and intend to do now. After restoring Tani to his throne, I meant to deal with his enemies, and now, as they are so neatly bound up and ready, I shall reward them well for their pains and treachery. Stop! A vast there and belay! shouted Samuel Salt as the Umbrellephant, obeying an order from the terrible old man, picked up Didjabo in his trunk and flew swiftly toward the cliff's edge. But Chanum, again dragging Samuel down, whispered fiercely in his ear. It is just a seaman, and only what we ourselves plan to do. The vines will keep these rogues afloat for two days, then happily they will sink. Not to die, as death comes not to the people of my country, but to lie for long forgotten ages at the bottom of the sea, harmless and sodden, and unable to do any more harm to the country they have so dishonorably served and betrayed. Shuddering, and in a tense silence, Samuel and the Sheik watched the Umbrellephant toss the wretched as a mandarins, one after the other, into the sea. The immense zooming monster fascinated the captain of the crescent moon. Not wings, but a balloon-like structure of its own tough skin billowing over its back like a howdah, enabled Umbo to navigate in the air. Samuel was anxious for further talk with the old man of the jungle. But as the last as a mandarin fell over the cliff, the Umbrellephant, with a trumpet of defiance, headed rapidly for the open sea. Look, look, it's getting away, cried Samuel, rushing to the cliff's edge and almost tumbling over. Do you realize that there goes the only Umbrellephant in captivity? Well, and what if it is, muttered Chunum, again pulling Samuel back to safety. I expect Boglador does not find this country healthy after the pretty story he had just told us, and come. Come, Master Seaman, what would you do with a flying elephant aboard your ship? A tie to the mast and carry it back to Oz, explained Samuel, staring gloomily after the disappearing prize. Why, it would be the most rare and amazing specimen ever brought back from anywhere, and now, now, I've lost it. Samuel's arms dropped heavily to his sides, and turning away from the cliff, he began walking slowly back toward Nicobo who had at last ventured to lift her head from the sand. 
Surprised enough was the hippopotamus to learn that she had been given her power of speech by the ugly little magician on the umbrella fan, and frightened lest she forget Tandy's language, she began talking rapidly to herself. "'But you forget what all this means,' panted Chunum, catching up with the explorer and shaking him energetically by the shoulder. "'Why, this clears up the whole mystery. Not an aunt, but an elephant carried Tisander to Pachipani Island. We must return quickly to the castle and release his innocent relatives. I myself will call back Tandy's frightened subjects and tell them of the great good fortune that has befallen, that we are rid of nine rogues and have a brave young king to rule Zamaland.' Come, come, do not stand there dreaming about lost elephants. There is much to be accomplished and done. Goose wing my topsails, you're right, breathed Samuel Salt, coming completely out of his reverie. Round up the citizens, comrade, and I'll carry the good news to the castle. End of chapter 19 Chapters 20 of Captain Salt in Oz this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pseudonymous Nerd in Mumbai, India. Captain Salt in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter 20 King Tandy. When Samuel reached the castle, he found Atto and Roger had set a small cosy table in the throne room and Tandy was anxiously looking out of one of the gold frame windows for his return. The whiffs from the covered dishes was so appetizing that the royal explorer of Oz was more, most inclined to let his news wait till afterward. But thinking better of it, he blurted out the whole story of what had happened in the Oz Mandarians. They're all gone and done for, sniffed Atto, seating himself at the head of the table. Well, a couple of years at the bottom of the sea should soak all the sin and wickedness out of them. And you say it was an umbrella fiend that carried Tandy off. My, and dear, dear, and dear, just pour me a cup of coffee, Roger. I'm feeling weaker than soup. Well, how do you suppose I feel? Grumbled Samuel Salt throwing up his hat onto a brown figure. To lose an elegant specimen like that. Why, I wager we'll never see another creature like it. There, there. Always talking about the elephant that got away instead of appreciating your good fortune. Scolded Atto, throwing a corn muffin to Nikobo and lifting the gold cover of the roast fowl. Yes, and you'd better listen to our new smashed salt. Roger said, pouring a cup of coffee for all hands. News? News? Has anything happened here? Samuel looked more anxious than interested. Oh, yes, cried Tandy, running around to his side of the table and pressing eagerly against Samuel's knee. Roger has a wonderful plan, and I, as king of Ozamaland, have agreed to it. And oh, Samuel, Samuel! Forgetting he usually called the tremendous sea man captain, Tandy flung both his arms around his neck and almost squeezed the breath out of him. I'm going back to the crescent moon and I'm not coming ashore for years and years. I'm going with you to Ev, Oz, Elbow Island and everywhere. <coughs> what? Spluttered. Samuel Salt, disentangling himself with great difficulty and holding off Tandy at arm's length. Are you joking? Are you crazy? Have you abdicated or what? Why, this is good, too good to be true. But it is true insisted Roger, strutting up and down the table and idly increasing his pride and satisfaction. Oh, tell him, tell him, begged Tandy, too happy to speak for himself. Well, said Roger, spreading his wings self-consciously. The plan was his and he felt prouder of it every minute. We are placing Ozamaland under general rule and protection of Oz and leaving as ruler in Tandy's place the long-legged son of desert Chunmun. Now, there's a fellow who can handle these scary nobles and natives as wild elephants and camel riders. A king must complete his education before he starts ruling, you know. Roger paused to scratch his head and wink gaily at Samuel Salt. And if this king chooses to finish his education on shift, that is his own affair. Oh, quite, quite, 
Samuel said hastily, beginning to rock backward and forward and roar with merriment. Ho! Oh, Roger, you rascal, you've done as good a job of reasoning as a whole flock of wise men. Fall to, mates. Now we can enjoy our victuals. And I give you a toast to King Tandy, cabin boy, explorer, and artist extraordinary to this expedition. Tandy! Tandy! echoed Atto and Roger in a weird sort of voice, lifting their copy cups. Tandy, Tandy, mumbled Nicobo, who was lunching largely and luxuriously on the flowers in a low window box. When do we sail? End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 of Captain Salt in Oz This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Salt in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson A voyage resumed. Anxious as Tandy was to return to the crescent moon and continue the voyage, it was a whole week before they finally shoved off. Chunum, true to his word, had rounded up the frightened citizens of the capital and explained to them the wicked plots of the Ozamandarings and the punishment by Boglador, the old man of the jungle. Then Tandy, addressing them from the castle balcony, called upon them to consider Chunum as their king until he himself should have completed his education in foreign parts and aboard the Crescent Moon, during which time he promised to keep them always in mind and have their welfare always at heart. Next, Tandy explained how Ozamaland was now a province and under the general rule and protection of Ozma of Oz, how settlers from that famous fairyland would soon arrive to help them build new cities and towns, tame the wild jungles of the interior, and repel the dangerous invasions of the greys. Here, Chanum rose to declare he himself would be responsible for peace along the border between Amaland and Ozamaland, that the greys had long desired to be friends with the whites, but trouble had been stirred up by those amandarings, so they might have the credit of protecting the country. Then Tandy spoke again of all the advantages that would be enjoyed from their association with Kingdom of Oz. It was a long and splendid speech. Roger and Tandy having spent the whole morning in its preparation, and delighted and surprised by the energy and ambition of their young ruler, Tandy's subjects cheered him long and vociferously greeting each new plan and proposal with loud acclaim and enthusiasm. The royal aunts and relatives, already released from the castle dungeons and restored to their royal dwellings, could not speak highly enough of their young relative's bravery and cleverness, and the bravery and cleverness of all his new friends. They quite wore Nicobar out with their questions and petting, and the hippopotamus sighed hugely for the time when they would all be at sea. Was I right or was I wrong? questioned Roger on the third afternoon as Tandy, resplendent in his coat suit of white velvet, reviewed the vast parade of loyal nobles and natives, and the long lines of elephants and camels went sweeping by the palace. They love you just as much for going away as they would if you stayed, and Chunum is a man in a million. Right, Tandy nodded, waving happily to the crowds that in a high holiday mood thronged the walks and parks of the beautiful white city. Chanum had taken Samuel Salt and Atto on an expedition into the jungle, so that the royal explorer of Oz could procure a creeping bird and flying reptile for his collection. Nicobo, all jungleer that she was, had gone along to see that no harm came to them. To Tandy, a snake with feathers and a bird with scales and fangs was no novelty, but Samuel, returning with a pair of each, considered them the most peculiar and precious of his queer specimens. He carried their cages everywhere he went, and spent long rapt hours watching the snakes fly and the birds creep about their new cages. Atto had discovered a new and rare fruit, and had brought along several slips to plant in the rail boxes he had outside the galley. Nicobo had swum to her heart's content in a green and muddy jungle stream, and all three were now quite ready and anxious to continue the voyage. Aboard the crescent moon, one of the guards had been established to feed the monkey fish and water boy and tend to the plants in the hold and serve as a watchman. An early one bright morning, just a week after they had landed, the members of the Royal Exploration Party of Oz set forth from the palace. Oz flags fluttered and snapped in the fresh morning breeze, mingling with the white banners of Azamaland, and the streets and avenues were lined with Tandy's cheering and now quite cheerful subjects. Riding in Nicobo, accompanied by Chanum on a white elephant and the entire camel corps and elephant guard, the party made their way down to the water's edge. 
feeling exactly, as Ato whispered in a laughing undertone to Roger, like a whole circus and a zoo. Besides Roger, Tandy, Samuel Salt and Ato, Nicobo carried two large cages and two small cages. In the small cages were the flying reptiles and creeping birds. In the large cages a baby white camel and a baby white elephant. You'll sink, my lass, worried Samuel Salt, as Nicobo, having safely made her way down the rocky cliff road, waded confidently out into the sea. Not me, murmured the hippopotamus comfortably. You may get wet, but I'll get you safely out to the ship, trust me. Goodbye, goodbye all, cried Tandy, standing up on her back to wave to the crowds collected on the cliffs. Now that he was leaving, he felt a strange fondness for them. Goodbye, Chonum, I'll be back, never fear. Goodbye, little fellow, goodbye, little king. A fair and far away voyage to you, called the tall old desert chief, standing up in his stirrups to wave his long lance. To the sun, the moon, the stars I commend you. Go in happiness and return in health, and live long to rule over Ozamaland. You take care of the country, and we'll take care of the king, shouted Samuel. Goodbye, be watching all of you for the ships from us. Goodbye, called the nobles, the natives, the guards, even the elephants and camels raised their shrill voices in farewell, as Nicobo swam strongly away from the shore and toward the crescent moon. The guard left in charge of the ship thankfully turned the vessel over to its rightful owners, and, shaking Tandy feelingly by the hand, climbed down the ladder and dropped nervously on the back of the hippopotamus, who was to carry him to shore. Here, brainless, lend a hand with the freight, yelled Roger as Tandy stood gazing rather thoughtfully toward the cliffs. The king's ashore, long live his cabin boy. I'll carry these pesky reptilia if you take the camel. Roger winked at Tandy as Samuel Salt, bent double under the baby elephant's cage, started carefully down to the hold. The baby camel and its cage were so small Tandy could manage them quite easily, and with a little laugh he hurried after Samuel and Roger. By the time they had finished, Nicobo had returned from her shore trip and climbed thankfully back on her raft. All hands stand by to heave up the anchor, bellowed Samuel, stepping cheerfully over to his sail controls. Anchors away, and away we go, boys, and the hippopotamus take the hindmost. Ho, oh, ho, oh, well, she's built for it, roared Atto, bending his weight to the cable as sail after sail rattled up the masts and bellied out from the yards. Where to now, Samuel? Oz? Oz, I should say not. We have a lot of geography to discover before we go back to Oz. We'll need a rock's egg before we go there, eh, Tandy? A rock's egg and sixty more islands for Ozma's Christmas stocking. Oh, will we really spend Christmas in Oz? cried Tandy, skipping up and down the deck, and forgetting all about his subjects waving from the cliffs. Why not? demanded Samuel Salt, letting his hands fall happily upon the wheel. Oz is as merry a place as any to spend Christmas, eh, Roger? Merry as eight bells, cried Roger, flying joyfully into the rigging. Ahoy, nothing but sea to seaward. And when the crescent moon flies over Ev and drops down the Winky River on Christmas morning with its chart full of islands and curious continents and its hole full of strange beasts, plants and treasure, I for one should like to be there. Shouldn't you? The End Since 1900, when L. Frank Baum introduced to the children of America the wonderful Wizard of Oz and all the other exciting characters who inhabit the land of Oz, these delightful fairy tales have stimulated the imagination of millions of young readers. These are stories which are genuine fantasy, creative, funny, tender, exciting and surprising, filled with the rarest and most absurd creatures. Each of the 39 volumes which now comprise the series has been eagerly sought out by generation after generation. Until today, they are known to all except the very young or those who were never young at all. When in a recent survey, the New York Times polled a group of teenagers on the books they liked best when they were young, the Oz books topped the list. Captain Salt in Oz A voyage on the famous Nonestic Ocean. What could be more thrilling than that? We, many of us, have taken trips on the prosaic Atlantic or even Pacific, but have we found a sea forest with flying fish and swimming birds? Have we been pursued by a real sea serpent? or had our ship transfixed by the immense ivory tusk of a narwhal? Have we come upon the glittering island of Pekinspire, or made friends with the charming talking hippopotamus? Yet all these things and more befall Captain Salt, 
one time pirate and now royal explorer of Oz, and his merry crew. They come back with their hold bursting with unique and fascinating specimens, with their chart crowded with new islands, claimed for Ozma, and drawn so realistically by the delightful little boy Tandy, cabin boy and artist of the expedition. End of chapter 21 End of Captain Sold in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson <laughs>